Architecture Codex. If you want to see more, like, comment, share, and most importantly, subscribe. Many people in the Americas look towards Europe, Africa, and Asia with a bit of envy since their history goes back so much further than ours. Among the more romanticized buildings of the Old World are the castles, those massive stone fortifications that were an essential part of every city's defense budget prior to the introduction of Chinese gunpowder to Europe in the 13th century. And since Columbus brought news of the New World to Western civilization only 200 years later, you might conclude that the need to build castles in the Americas never existed. But you would be wrong. Consider that as Canada was first being settled in the 16th and 17th centuries by rival French and English forces, many fortresses were built, including Fort George, the citadel on the hill overlooking Halifax Harbor, Fortress Louisbourg on the edge of the Breton Highlands, and Quebec City, at the time an almost medieval walled city. And further south in the region, where Spain and Portugal were vying for territory, there was in Cartagena, in present-day Colombia, Castillo San Felipe de Barajas, which was an active fortress for almost 300 years and built continuously from 1536 through 1767. The Spanish Main, the New World colonies of the Spanish Empire on the main land mass of the Americas was a great source of wealth for Spain. Precious metals, gemstones, spices, and plant and animal products were brought from inland to ports such as Portobello, Maracaibo, Veracruz, and Cartagena de Indias in New Granada. These cities loaded the great Spanish galleons with the rich products of the New World to be brought back to Spain. Obviously then, these sea routes were harassed by French, Dutch, and English pirates, or buccaneers, who were given the euphemistic name privateers when that harassment was officially chartered by the kings of Europe. But before they could load all this produce onto those ships, it had to be stored and protected. You can't really critique the architecture of a fortress the same way you might critique a new museum by one of our leading architects. You don't look at the batter walls of an exterior fortification and comment that the angle is emotionally evocative, sort of a neo-functional mannerism, cerebral and yet oblique. No. Fortresses like bridges are form follows function, which may be why they appeal to the modernist in me. So I will discuss less about style choices and more about logical reasons. The function of a fortress is to protect men and property from invaders and looters. So they usually grow from the inside out in ever increasing rings of protective stone, adding more and more security. After Sir Francis Drake sacked the city of Cartagena in 1586, work began on both the city walls and the citadel at the top of the 120-foot tall hill of San Lorenzo, which used the natural waterways as a moat around the castle. While the city walls, a series of fortified bastions, changed significantly as the shoreline geography changed, the first citadel at the top remains at the core of the castle. This small triangular space at the summit held about 20 men and about eight cannon. It was set back far enough from and above the Caribbean Ocean that ships at sea would have a hard time bombarding it. Yet when French privateer Baron de Pointus attacked in 1697, he was still victorious. So they made the citadel even bigger. By 1741, the fortress and the city had been expanded. They were able to repel an attack by the British that had 120 ships and 20,000 men 
with just 6,000 troops defended. The British took the city below, but only after a month of heavy casualties. Still, the British could not breach the fortress of what was by then called Castillo San Felipe de Barajas to honor Philip, the King of Spain. Apparently, tropical diseases played a heavy role in decimating the British forces. Oh, the British and their sensitive digestive systems. Even after that, the fortress expanded, enveloping the entire hill with stone and a permanent barracks for 500 men, and with tunnels that led to different parts of the city, allowing sorties to harass any enemy that might conquer the city below. Eventually, all the sections of the city wall bastions were connected, and the overall fortification improved under military engineer Antonio de Arevalo. Like many fortresses, the concentric rings of walls could each become the front line in the defense should an outer wall be breached. The castle was Spain's greatest structure in the New World, and it was so intimidating that no one ever attacked it again during the Spanish colonial period. While defensive city walls go back to the ancient city of Jericho, military engineering reached its first apex under the Romans, whose armies spent their time between battles building things. Some of the buildings were for military purposes, and that was known as martial engineering, and some were for the people, and that was known as civil engineering. When Rome fell, northern regions were thrust into a dark age, building mostly in wood and mud as brick and cut stone construction disappeared for many hundreds of years. Their fortresses were the Mott and Bailey variety, hills surrounded by wood, palisades, and ditches. But in the Eastern Byzantine Empire and throughout the Islamic region, stone fortifications were the rule. Perhaps one of the most famous surviving castles is the Crac de Chevalier, which was a 12th century citadel built by the Knights Hospitaller in present-day Syria. The Hospitallers, an order similar to the Knights Templar, built and occupied it for over 100 years. There's a very rich history about the Crusades, much more complicated and intriguing than what most people expect, but we're not going to go into that here. Instead, we're going to discuss a castle which T.E. Lawrence, that is, Lawrence of Arabia, described as the best preserved and most wholly admirable castle in the world. You can see that the castle had inner walls and towers, built first at the top of a promontory that gave them great views of the surrounding land. The views were for a military advantage and not aesthetic purposes. Built of limestone, the castle was one of the most solid human constructions since the pyramids, and the damage you see is mostly due to earthquake and not unfriendly attack. From the inner circle, a larger enclosure was built. Crack de Chevalier had an aqueduct for a water supply, cisterns and storerooms to survive long sieges, and as the Knights Hospitaller were a religious order, it also had a chapel. We see here typical fortress techniques which are used on castles in many different parts of the world and which we featured in Architecture Codex number 25 on Mont Saint-Michel. Castles are built on the higher ground so that any attacking army, their catapults, and any other missiles had to fight gravity. This also means the defending castle can easily cast large stones downward on the attackers. Batter walls, angled reinforced at the base, push ladders and siege engines away from wall tops, making it harder to climb over the top to breach the defenses. It also allowed defenders to bounce dropped things. These walls were often reinforced to be 30 to 40 feet thick, eventually to withstand earliest cannon fire. Just outside the batter walls, and occasionally within the ring of walls, would be a moat, wet or dry, to slow advancing troops or thwart siege engines, those big rolling platforms, from reaching the top of the castle walls. There would be towers along the perimeter walls to give even higher views of the surrounding terrain for the lookouts. They would also allow the defenders to shoot back on three sides at any attackers attempting to scale a wall. 
Entry to the castle would be through gates with barbican towers, drawbridges, and an iron trellis, a portcullis, that could be dropped in seconds by cutting a rope. There would be narrow beveled slotted openings in walls and towers, first for arrows to have a wide range of fire while protecting the archer. This was later adapted for cannon. Crenellations or merlins, solid and open blocks on top of the wall allowed defenders on the parapets to shoot between and also provided full height protection. Small buildings called machinolations if they were stone and hoardings if they were wood would overhang the walls making it even easier to drop things down on attackers. Often in the center there was a castle keep or tower, the last stronghold in case the perimeter walls were breached and usually the spiral staircases ascended clockwise in these towers to favor the knights upstairs who are right-handed and give them greater freedom to swing their swords. Among many other cross-cultural exchanges between Christianity and Islam, the Crusaders brought back to Western Europe stone-cutting skills, which inspired a burst of construction of both stone castles and Gothic cathedrals. It was this set of skills then that the Spanish brought to the New World when they constructed the fortress in Cartagena. Like the Crusades, the history of colonialism is full of both wonderful and horrendous events about which we feel smugly superior today even though our modern world has systemized mass murder. Both endeavors were part of a 7,000 year human tradition which regarded war as a vital part of geopolitics, not something to be avoided, but a tool to be used. This was before modern thought and modern technology brought our world to the point where we can exterminate millions of people with industrial efficiency. So maybe that has increased our abhorrence of war and expansion through military means. Regardless, the military buildings we leave behind are a testament to our humanity both our ability to be cruel to one another, but also the extent to which we will go, to which we will build to protect ourselves, our families, and our stuff. You simply have to admire the ingenuity behind it all. I'm Michael Molinelli, and this is Architecture Codex.